Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Father's House. Right here at 6060 Spalding. We'd love to have you to be a part of us when we get back together. So make your plans right now to join us. Uh, this is the Father's House right here in Peachtree Corners, uh, Georgia. And it's nothing like being in the house of God. So as you know, of course, this is probably one of the most critical times we've ever had where we talk, talked about this whole virus and just the impact on the church. So I, I get, talked last week about resurrection power, but I want to go back to where I started though two weeks ago, and I was talking to you about the church left the building. The church has left the building. And I, I didn't come up with that myself, but I do recognize it right now more than ever. We do want to say this, that the church has left the building, so then we have to look at ourselves and say, what is the church? So before I go deep into the message, I just want to, again, just encourage you to be a part of us. I don't know, many of you do know we also have a Bible study that all of you can be a part of. It's not just for our church, but we also have a Zoom Bible study where I'm talking about faith in crisis, faith in crisis. So if you want to be a part of that, that's 730, join our Zoom. If you go to our Facebook or you go to our website, it'll give you exactly how to, uh, to get in, get the ID number and everything. Just click and go right into our Zoom, 730 on Thursday night. Be a part of that because it's very important to build your faith up. The Bible says faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you have to increase your faith. And I believe if you spend one hour with me talking to you, preaching to you about faith, I guarantee your faith will increase. So that's what I just mentioned that. The other thing I want to tell you is we, before we get into the Word is that we are pushing a prayer time more than ever. Remember, now I'm actually going to refer to the Scripture in this today, but remember the Scripture, it says that my house shall be called a house of prayer. Well, today I'm going to give you some of the dynamics where, where the Lord said these thick statements. But I just want to say to you that now that we're not in the physical building to pray, now your house has to be a house of prayer. Your home has to be a house of prayer. So first, this right here is a house of prayer. But now also your home is a house of prayer. So what we're doing, we're trying to focus in our prayer time. So from 5 to 7. Now, this does require sacrifice. Why, why am I saying that? Because some of you are not working. Some of you are working from home now. So, so legitimately, you're able to, to have the comforts of home. Some of you work in your pajamas all day. I don't know what you're doing. But I'm saying that you join me between 5 and 7. So this is a concerted effort. This is as putting our focus together. We're at 5 to 7 o'clock, and you can take a 30-minute slot or an hour slot. I really don't care. But you focus it in your prayer, and we're, gonna, we're focusing on five different things. Number one, we're praying for our governmental leaders. Still have to do this. Praying for our governmental leaders. That includes the President of the United States, the Vice President, those that are making medical decisions and giving advice, those in Congress, and also all the way down to the governors and even those mayors and municipalities. So we have to pray for them for wisdom. I'm praying for my governor for wisdom. Pray for your governor for wisdom in terms of how to proceed because at some point we're going to be coming out of this. And actually, it may even take more wisdom to come out of it to even get into it. So I want to just say to you that what, what safeguards have to be done, particularly as it regards to our health, very, very important to have wisdom. So number one, pray for our government leaders. Number two, I, I wanted you to make sure you pray for your family. Keep your family in prayer. I've been hearing more and more cases now of direct family members or people that are very close that are involved in this. And let me just say this is very huge where you have to keep your people in prayer. Don't just assume it won't come down my dwelling uh, if I don't pray. So, so consistently pray for your household and everybody that's attached to you, everybody that's close to you, pray vociferously about it. That pray consistently. So anyway, so you pray for that. Also, I want you to pray for the church. Well, why am I praying for the church? Because the church needs prayer. See, we're, we're dispersed now. And again, I'm going to refer to this about the church leaving the building. But in this regard, I want you to be challenged now to pray for your church, your individual church, wherever you attend. And, and for those of you in this church, the Father's house, wherever you may be, Pray for the church, and even beyond that, pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the remnant right now, because the Bible says that judgment starts in the house of God. 
if judgment starts in the house of God, what happens? We are going to be challenged as a remnant to show the Lord that we are allowing him to break us, to mold us, to shape us, even as the potter shapes the, the, the mold of that clay in his hand. So therefore, in the context of this, I'm just encouraging you to pray for the body of Christ. Then also, what are we praying? Well, number one is we have to repent. Say, well, God, how long are we going to have to repent? Bishop, you said that about three weeks ago. Absolutely. I'm saying repent again. Why? Because it's important for our nation to repent because we know God is not satisfied with the way we've been carrying on our life before we shut it all down. They said, well, did God shut it all down or did the president shut it down? Did, did our governor shut it down? Do you understand that God is in control? He is in control. Now, this, every time something happens like this, you, we tend to think that man is coordinating our life. No, God is in control of this. So no question about it, be clear about it, that God shut everything down for us to have to evaluate ourselves and have a personal time of reflection about what God is saying to me. So, so listen to this. I'm asking the Lord, what are you saying to me? I want you to encourage you to say, Lord, what are you saying to me during this time? Because we have to come out of this transformed. We cannot go back to the life is normal, which I will refer to again in, in this message. We can't go back to that the, in the same state that we were in when we went into it. We can't. So it has to be. So you got to pray, Lord, Lord, we repent as a nation. And Nehemiah prayed, Lord, we have sinned. So we repent on behalf of our nation. Well, I didn't cause the, the, the guys in the, to have these abortion chambers and, and kill babies. I didn't make that decision, no. But we live in a nation that's legal. Where it's legal now to, to redefine a, a family or a marriage, is we, we, we're redefining gender. So, therefore, we take responsibility and say, Lord, we're sorry, we sinned. And then from there, we say, Lord, please give us your mercy. Forgive us, give us your mercy so that we can walk back in your favor. So, we can walk back in your favor. Pray for our land. And then, lastly, you're also going to pray for the spread of the gospel throughout all the world, the spread of the gospel throughout all the world. And why am I spending this time to say this? Because I know if your prayer closets are empty or you feel like you don't know what to pray, I have, I'm reminding you, reminding you, stay in the prayer closet. Take, listen, get on your phone, put on your alarm, get up, get up, wake up. Because why? Because God is saying to us that he is beckoning for us to come to him. He says, well, if you seek me early, you will find me. So he's beckoning us to come to him. So this is more than ever. This is a great time for you to have your personal time with the Lord. And then also it can be unlimited because during this time, but why am I saying all this? Because I want you to be personally transformed because your personal transformation is going to impact the church. The church is going to impact the nation. The nation is going to impact the world. So God is counting us on us individually while we have left the building, that therefore we come into his presence. We left the building, but not his presence. All right, you ready for the word? Well, good. I'm, I'm glad about that. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a general offering at the end. So, so understand this. You, I, I'll tell you how to give, so, so don't worry about it. But I want you also to give because we're all giving together. Those of you also that are outside of us and, and you're just looking in, please be, be, be happy for you to give. We, we, we just invite you to. So let's get into the Word now. And I want to just say a prayer about the Word because I do believe it's a critical Word right now for this very hour. So the Bible, and, and what are we talking about? The church has left the building. So, Lord, I pray right now as we get into the Word of God, the Lord, that it would be something that is so precise and, Lord, given by revelation and given by Lord, I pray, Father, that even as we spend our time, not just to be entertained because we're looking at this on our phones or looking at it on a tablet or, or even a television, Lord, I pray, Father, that, Lord, speak to each one of us specifically. Give a rainbow word right now that we together may walk in the fullness of your, your calling. So we bless you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to just I want to ask you to just give me the liberty 
to kind of take my time here because I, I, I get so excited when I think about ministering the word to you because there's so much inside of me to give. I have all week to spend time with the Lord. I'm, I'm writing down notes all the time. I have a journal that I take and I'm reading, writing notes all the time. So, so in this context, I, I get so excited because I want to give it all to you. But I want to teach you as well as I want to uh, exhort you, encourage you, and, and, and convict you. So these kind of things have to be a part of the message. So if you remember a couple weeks ago, I'm going to repeat it again, that when we talk about the church, let's examine the church itself. So the church itself is translated from the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia, which simply means the people assembled, the people assembled. Matter of fact, in an earlier societal meaning, it actually was a public assembly of the people a public assembly of the people. So, so when you start talking about the church, it's the assembly. Now, remember I gave the scripture many, many times to you, and this is probably what is it, challenging us as pastors because he, the Bible actually says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. See, so, so therefore the assembly is very, very vital. As a matter of fact, when, when the first church, the first Gentile church, the first Gentile church was that those that weren't Jews came together to walk with the Jews. So the first Gentile church actually was founded in Antioch. And if you go back to Acts 11, uh, 20 to 21, it's recorded that that's where the disciples were first called Christians. First called Christians in, in Antioch. So, so Antioch was kind of the key place, and that's also where, where Paul actually started his missionary journeys out, out of Antioch. So, so even when you go all the way back, that, there always have been temples, there have been physical buildings, even where Jesus would come in, he would declare the truth, he would teach the truth. All these things happened within a physical building. So, so it's when the church was established, there was a church in Antioch. Cause of, course, of course, we've always had physical buildings. But understand this, even from that point in time, they were not tied to it. They weren't tied to their building because they had to go out and minister the word throughout the whole world. So it's very important realizing that. So let me go back and also tell you about the five uh, purposes for the church. The five purposes for the church. The first one is worship. We all have to worship. We all love to worship the God. If we worship Him, we worship Him in spirit and truth. I love worship. I don't know. When I come to worship, man, I just get so excited because it's just so awesome when the praise is going forth. We're loving the Lord. I mean, just nothing but pure worship. Matter of fact, you know what I've been doing lately? I've been having um, my worship music playing while I'm spending time with the Lord. And now I'm, I'm trying to find songs that we know and new songs. Why? Because I love worship. One of the things that I miss so much is work. Don't you miss the worship? And so, so in that regard, we worship is one thing because we're worshiping the Lord who he is, the glory of God who he is. He's our father. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. He's the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. Man, if I could sing I you right now. I tell you what, but, but the thing I'm saying to you is that it's so very vital. It's so very vital that we worship. Another thing is fellowship. See? We need each other. The, 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 the arm the, the knee, needs the neck and the neck needs the joints and the joints need the leg. And every, well, we need everything. Everything needs to each other. But you cannot isolate yourself or stay isolated and think that you are the church alone. See, we, we need one another to work together. He said, let them be one, even as I am and the Father are one. So he was speaking to his disciples. So therefore, the church needs to be together as a fellowship. So let me just say this to you. Some of you, you know how you guys do. You know, I trust coming out of this that you begin to really respect the church and what it is and who we are together. Because many of you, you know, I, I'm not going to call your names now here, you know, on the Internet like that, even though I'm thinking about a couple of you. So some of you kind of come to church once a month. And once a month. I mean, you come uh, twice. And you really just got a favor for twice a month. In other words, well, I don't have to come. I don't feel like it. I'm, a, I'm home. I got bedside baptist going on. So what I'm saying to you is that God knows your name. Let me come up closer because maybe I, I want to make sure you know I'm talking to you. What I'm saying is, at some point, God is, is drawing you closer. 
So during this time, fellowship becomes a necessary part of relationship. And let me just say another thing, too. Sometimes people have negative backgrounds and in bad situations where they've, they've uh, had situations where they've become burnt stone. What do you mean? In other words, you've had people that disappoint you, pastors that disappoint you, people that offend you in the church. You cannot go before the Lord and say, well, because I was offended at my last church, I'm not going to go around those Christians anymore. You know, how they say the worst hurt is church hurt. I know it's true. It is. It is very, it's very hurtful. But you still have to grow up and get beyond it. Is that too hard for you? That's too hard. You got to grow up and get beyond it and get back in it. You got to trust again. You got to trust again. I don't know who I'm talking to, but some of you have been dispersed way before this time of isolation. As a matter of fact, you like this isolation because it, 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 it almost rewards you for your separation. No, that's to be inside of you something that you want to get back with the people of God. All right, now, you know, like I said, I'm, t I'm talking to you. Uh, you know who you are, and I'm not going to call your name. So, so you have the fellowship. You, you have also discipleship. Well, what is discipleship? Discipleship is just like Jesus did with disciples. He taught them. He trained them. He poured out his heart to them. As a matter of fact, discipleship is even greater than just teaching the Word. But discipleship is also living the word in front of somebody. And so they see the word, let it manifest, so they're being discipled. So part of the church is also discipleship, is training, is, is impartation, fathering, all those things. So discipleship. Another one is ministry. Well, ministry is what? It's ministering to people. It, it's the compassion. It's reaching people. Actually, ministry actually means serving. It's the service of the church. So we're always serving and giving and giving. So, so goodness, Bishop, why are you spend so much time with it? Because I need you to see the value of the church. Because if the church has left the building, what is the church supposed to look like when we come back together? And then the most important thing is the Great Commission. You see, you see, in Matthew 28, I am going to read this one to you, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You know what it says? I'm reading out of King James right now. It says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So, so see, from the resurrection, we just acknowledge resurrection just, just this past week. So, so all power has been given unto me, all power in heaven and in earth. So, so he wasn't lacking any power, all the power in the kingdom, Jesus has now, and he says, but he says, so, so basically what this is a transfer of power. What was happening? You, you know, um, I, I personally am an attorney, but do you know that each one of us can have power of attorney without going to law school? In other words, if somebody gave you all the power that they had, they gave you the power that they possess, and they gave it over to you. They did it in a document or something. They wrote it out, signed it, somebody notarized it or what, whatever it might be. The key is that they're able to give you the power so you can go into their bank account. You can take care of their personal uh, needs or whatever the situation is, their per personal business. So, so what Jesus is doing now, he is giving to the church all the power that he has. So when I talked about resurrection power last week, I'm saying to you right now that all the power that Jesus has, he's given it to us. And then he says, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what happens is you're teaching the nations, just like you've been taught of me. You're teaching the nations, and you're baptizing them once they give their life to Jesus. You're baptizing them. And then it goes on even further and says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So the end of the world could be by space or the end of the world could be by time. But whatever it is, he said, I'm going to be with you, but teach them what I taught you. So, so understand this. So that's the great commission. Take the word of God to all the world. So those are the things. Right? Worship, fellowship, what? Discipleship, 
ministry and mission. You got that? You got it? Okay, good, good. So I want you to get that, but the reason I have to tell you this and teach you this is because now we have to define ourselves since the church is not identified with the building. And I think he wanted us to see this. I believe he wanted us to see that the church is not identified with the building. I mean, you might have a storefront church. I don't know. You may have an independent church. You may be in an industrial area. You may have this big facility on acres of land. No matter how much brick and mortar had to be put together to put a physical church together, it could be beautiful. Even Solomon's temple was beautiful. So there's nothing wrong with a beautiful building, but you can't find purpose from God or the commission of God identifying with the building, the only way you can have that purpose is you have to identify with the mandate from the Holy Ghost as he's pushing the church to obey him. So, so in it, inside the building, you may have training, you may have nursery, you may have youth ministry, you, have, you may have a choir, you may have all these things that we come together, but that's just a location. That's just a location. But God's calling us this is, to a destination. He's calling us to a destination. What's our destination? To reach the world. Our destination is to reach the world. Come on. you got to see this with me. But I, I, I'm purposely slowing myself down to try to understand, so you can understand the church, the, the remnant, the one who said, if my people are called by my name. So if you're called by my name, there's certain expectations. Isn't it? If somebody has your name, you, you, there's certain expectations that you have. Here's an expectation that you understand the whole purpose of the church. So here we go. So we got it now. I, I, by the way, wait, well, you know, the other thing too is that when we think about church growth, you know, we tend to think about church growth because you have just the right amount of time and service. Or, you know, how you conduct the church. And is, it, is it organized well? All, all those kind of things, right? And so, but you know what? Because they preach the gospel, they preach the gospel so powerfully, Peter preached right then 3,000 souls were saved. Come on. Well, if you look at it, it, it said that in Acts 2, 47, it says that and the Lord added to the church daily. Added to the church daily. If you jump over to Acts 8, it talks about how there was great persecution of the church. But then it says Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women carried in the prison. So in other words, what happened? He was going house to house, just like the church is in the house. And I, I think I said it to you a couple of weeks ago. If a person comes into your community and comes to your neighborhood, and they asked about you. So, so you, got, you guys know who lives around there, on that corner right there? Who, uh, who, tell me something about them. Would, would they even know enough about you to know that you are a born-again believer? That, that you live for God? That, that you that you live for God? Would they even, what, what, what distinguishes you from everybody else in your neighborhood? So, so listen, I understand that we're at a place right now where people don't congregate. They don't want to know each other. I just see you. I might wave. I do understand that. But I'm saying to you also that Paul was able to identify the Christians, and he wouldn't pour them out house by house. So, so then let's bring me to this, this question, man. Right now, everybody's asking a question. They said, uh, when can we get back to normal? When can we get back to normal? I've asked the question. I said it to me. I said it myself. I mean, because think about it. Movie theater. Can't go to a movie. You, you can't go to, to the mall to, to get new clothes. You, you, you can't, can't even go. Listen, some of y'all like Ross. You can't even go to Ross. You, you get, can't do all that. Listen, you can't even go to the gym. I go to the gym every, every day if I can get to the gym. But what? You can't even go to the gym. So most of the things that you do, it's like everything is disarray, much less the financial institutions, all, all, these, all these different things. So what the question is now, what happens when we get back to normal? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that God wants us to just redo the old normal? You think the Lord is going to reward us to say, my whole purpose for this 
was just so you can take a little reprieve and then everything goes back to the old normal? Or is it possible that God It's pretty much predictable. So that's, that's what normality is. So, but the Lord in this time, and I'm giving the Lord, I'm giving the Lord the credit. He disrupted your normality. Would you agree with that? I mean, some of you don't even get out of the house. I mean, he disrupted whatever your normality would be. It's totally disrupted now. So, so what is the new normal that you're expecting? You ever thought about that? See, after the, this COVID-19 is, is over, or it, you, some people are saying that, you know, in reality, once we have gone through this, things won't be the same. What, what does that mean? Well, maybe you got to, well, more people will wear masks. Maybe people wear gloves. I don't know. Maybe it's even that you, they require vaccinations. I, I don't know. I don't know what it might be. But whatever the case is, let me just say this to you, that there will be some changes. But I want to ask you this other question. What personal things will change for you? What, what things have changed already in the prayer closet that, that has already occurred inside of you that will change your priorities in this new normal? I mean, what, what, what does that look like? I want to just say to you that, I, and this is really what I feel. I feel like our lifestyle has changed, but it doesn't mean that the nature, your nature has changed. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, what I'm saying to you is very simple. What I'm saying to you is that have you begun to examine yourself? Because remember, man, man is driven by three main sins. Three. One. Let's go together. What, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So you can disrupt your normality, pull away and not do what you normally do, and still have the same behavior. You still have that same nature. So God's trying to change us from all that. Now, I, I, I looked at this thing, and I went over to John chapter 2, uh, 13 through 17. Um, you, you got to remember this. Jesus, after Passover, Jesus was coming. Well, I was actually doing a, a celebration, I should say. Jesus was coming to the, the city, and he went to the temple. And uh, if you pick up right there, it says he, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he saw merchants selling cattle sheep and doves for sacrifices. He said he also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. And it's in the church. It's in the building. So Jesus, listen to this, he made a whip. <laughs> he sat down. You know, if this was if this is our timetable, you have to say he he, he maliciously with intent <laughs> To commit an act, he sat down and wove a whip and looked around. He, he didn't do it at first. He just looked around, looking at all the stuff. I, I can imagine why he was weaving this thing. It must have been wearing him out. I cannot believe what's going on. These folks, about, they're about to be in trouble. He was, he was working that whip together. And he, so he put the thing together, and it says he made a whip from some ropes and chased them out of the temple. Chase them out. Now, we always think about this soft Jesus. Oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, you know, where's the, where's the mercy? <laughs> Jesus came with a whip and ran them out of the temple. 
He drove out, it says he drove out the sheep, the cattle. He scattered the money changers, coins all over the floor. He even turned over the tables, kicked the tables. This is Jesus. He came in the church disrupting everything violently. And then, you know what he said? Get these things out of here. He said, stop turning the Father's house into a marketplace. And in another version, like it says, he said he went, this is Luke chapter, chapter uh, what am I, 1945. You know what it says? It says, he went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold therein and, then, and them that bought, saying, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Do you think this is a nice, soft thing? Man, I, listen, you guys would be calling up the, 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 the National Guard. You'll be calling up the, the, the uh, uh, Homeland Security. You, if somebody came in from another place, came into a temple, and just started terrorizing, oh, yeah, there's a terrorist coming in, knocking over tables, kicking over things, throw, whipping people out of here. But Jesus did this because he said, and this is what I really love about it, 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 it the, the, the scripture at John chapter 2, getting towards 17, it says, then the disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture. He said, passion for God's house will consume me. The zeal of the passion of the Lord will consume him for the Lord's house. He loves his house. So what goes on in his house is of high priority to him. So follow with me in this conversation. Do you think it's possible that one of the reasons that the Lord shut down the church was because he was not happy with the church? Is it possible that we become too focused on money? Is it possible we become too focused on seeker-friendly, making everybody happy? You know, there's some churches I, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticize church. I want to deal with all of us. But I'm saying, if you can go to a church and not at least get opportunity to get saved and get no altar call, no, no one can pray for you. In other words, you want it so seeker-friendly that no one is ever challenged. You can you imagine if he's allowing other people to turn their head towards sin and they know that there are things going on and they just refuse to acknowledge it. All these things, so you're talking about commercialization, you're talking about marketing, all these things going on, and just the church becoming a business, not a place of prayer. Is it possible that the message that the Lord wants the church to give, the pastors to give, maybe he's challenging that? So, so to disrupt the church, just like Jesus did, he showed his displeasure. So this is why I'm telling I'm praying right now. I'm saying, Lord, what is the new norm? looking like. And, and, and to be honest with you, I, you, he just gives you just a glimpse here, a glimpse there. I, I don't even know if he even tells us all at one time, but what I do know is that ultimately speaking, he wants us to have a life where we're totally given over to him, where the whole church loves him with all of our heart, where we're not there for, oh, that's another one, the church of entertainment. No, we're not here to be entertained. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a shame, though, because you, you sit in rows and you look at the back of somebody's head, and so everything focused toward the front. So, you know, you're judging things. This is the praise song I like. Is this what's going on? Do I enjoy this? So you have all these things going on in your mind, and so you're thinking about what I have to go home and to eat. Sometimes some of the kids may be in there texting each other in church. What I'm saying is all these things are going on right in the church. And some of the motivations aren't right. So what happens is the church, as opposed to being a place of honoring him, ends up being a place of fleshly activity. So, so Jesus cast all that stuff out. He cast it out with a vengeance. So if the church has left the building, I just want to say let's learn the lessons that Jesus wants us to learn. So when we come back in, man, we, we're on fire from God. We're passionate with God. We're loving the Lord. And no one has to force us to come. Please, I know that technology it can be a benefit. Let's say if you're sick at home and you cannot make it. It's so awesome to be able to, you know, go to your phone or 
go go to your device and be able to you know get get your church service right there. But if you are strong, you're able to go to work, you're able to party on Saturday night, you able to do all these things. You at least make an effort to show even your children, your parents, be an example. Take those kids to church. Man, I'm really dealing with y'all right now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to call your name. What I'm saying is it's too important right now for, to give an example. I remember I never, I don't care what I did, I could go out, think I was grown, go out, do all the foolishness I want to do Saturday night when I was in high school, all that. There was no doubt about it. I'm being at church on Sunday morning. So, so where is that? What in the world is going on now that the kids decide if they feel like going to church? What? The children make their own decisions and they feel like going to church? Is there a prophet in the home? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. No. Our household will follow God. Yes. I'm all in your business today. Jesus. I had not even planned. I'm trying to, I'm trying to preach the word, but, I, but I'm telling you right now that I believe that we ought to value the church more. Maybe the reason that he shut, get, put us out of this church is because he wants us to come back with a greater value for us being together. Because I, I think also, you know, something else, I'm I just looking at my notes here. <sighs> You know, one of the things that we'll do, we, we're afraid of this virus, afraid, afraid. We don't know who has it. We don't know who's carrying it. We don't know. And, and it's true. It is very true. You, you want to do everything you can to protect yourself because it's something that we have not yet been able to control or define. But let me just say this to you. <laughs> I know we're afraid of the virus, but I want to tell you something real. You better be afraid of God. If we're going to fear the Bible, fear, fear the virus, we better fear God. <laughs> fear God. Why? Because, listen, God has no problem. Listen to this. He, when he wants to get our attention, do you know in biblical proportions, as well as now, God will allow people to die to get your attention. <laughs> Sometimes it takes that. Why? Because it brings fear in you. You, you, you're afraid of death. You don't want nobody in your family to die. So you do everything you can to do. But let me just say this to you. God is a God of judgment and a God of justice. So we better make sure that during this time we're getting on the right side of God, not the right side of Lysol. Wow. That's pretty good. Amen, Bishop. What I'm saying to you is that Although we can disinfect everything and we get our hands straight, I, I, I just, I just before I came out here, I, I, I literally had some hand sanitizer. What I'm saying to you, that's fine. But I said this a couple weeks ago, but I want to say it again. Don't spend all your time cleaning the outside the cup when your inside is dirty and nasty. <laughs> we have to Go and clean the inside. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself right with God, man. Because if you're going to try to tell my fear of virus, but you, you better fear God. Because actually, we might be going through just the beginning of birth pains right now. Have you read Matthew 24? Have you? It talks about wars and rumors of wars. I mean, Things that we have all right now, I mean, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, fires, uncontrollable fires are happening. This does not have to be just a virus. Listen, locust evasions in Africa. Do you realize that even once we get past this, God has all manner of ways of getting our attention? So, so the key is, I have to listen to him. I got to say, Lord, what are you doing with me? It always starts here. Look, you, you unravel the onion, unravel to see what God is saying to me. And I'm not saying to you something that I don't have to do myself. It, this, this unraveling doesn't have a, a, a title on it. In other words, God's not impressed with a title. 
He's not impressed with how long you've been born again, saved, sanctified, all the people you know, all the, you might go all the way back to cassette tapes. I don't know. You, you may have been around the things of God so long that you begin to take it for granted. Oh, oh, that's just him. That's just another word. That's, oh, yeah. Do you know that Jesus himself, have you ever read the scripture? He said that Jesus himself could not perform miracles in his own hometown. Why? Because they were too familiar. So because they said, this is just Joseph's son. So out of their familiarity, they did had no faith. So in the absence of faith, he couldn't do great works of great miracles. He couldn't do it. This is Jesus. Because we become too familiar. I want to just say to you, one of the worst things that can ever happen is that you become so familiar with your pastor, with the church, with the other saints and all this, and you know them just by the flesh and you don't know them by the spirit. You're not praying for them. You're not giving your life over to them. You're not serving them. You're not ha- you don't have hospitality. You don't love unconditionally. You're not, you're, not, you're not opening yourself up to one another. If you don't do this and you become so familiar, God can't do great things cannot do great things. Why? Because you're too familiar. And some of you, I'll be honest with you, you're too familiar with God. Why can I be too familiar with God? Well, you know, sometimes we get so casual. So, because we say, well, God's like this. God does that. God, uh, God says this. Those of you that know me well, if you know me, I don't say a lot of God said this, God told me that, God said this, God told me that, God said this, God told me that. I don't say a lot of that. You know why? Because I am not going to ever put on God something that's in my brain, myself. Oh, God told me. No, I told me. I want you to think that it's God. So I preface it with saying, God told me that my season is up at this church. Oh, okay. You come and tell me that, what can I say? What can I say to you if you say God told me, God told me to that this is my husband, and he, you ain't met him yet. God told me that I'm going to get this job, but you haven't even applied yet. Okay, well, listen, what I'm saying to you, just be careful. Sometimes we get so familiar even with God that we personalize him and think that whatever we think, he thinks. No, no. Our, our thoughts, we want, we want our thoughts to be the thoughts he thinks. So our thoughts are not his thoughts. But fortunately, if we yield to him, if we give over to him and yield to him, then we can walk in the spirit. But walk in the spirit is a yieldedness. Oh, man, you guys, I, I'm really all the way over to your personal walk today But because this thing is so very funny. So this is what I'm saying to you. Fear God more than you fear this virus. Fear God more than you fear this virus because ultimately God is in control of it all. He's ultimately in control of it all. You know, I think I have time to give you this one last example. Um, God told David, this is in First Chronicles, and now this is, this is going to be my first, I think, in second close. Here we go. First, it says First Chronicles, um, 21. You, you probably need to read the whole thing. So for sake of time, I'm just going to kind of highlight it in my last few minutes here. First Chronicles chapter 21, it says that, I'm, I'm just going to pick up around 14 to 15. It says that, so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and it says 70,000 people died as a result. You heard me. 70,000. This is in biblical times. The, the populations were nearly as much as it is now. 70,000 people died as a result of the Lord sending a plague. Well, why, 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 why did he send a plague? Well, David disobeyed. He told David not to count the people. But yet, he still told the servant, go count the people. Matter of fact, the servant didn't want to do it. He said, man, I don't, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to. But, but he did it. And so, the, and in matter of fact, once one of the scriptures actually says Satan rose up against David to, to really, to make him do, 
go against what God told them. But whatever the case was, David, as the king, pushed to do something that God told him not to do because he did not want David to have any confidence in their numbers. He wanted all his only confidence to be in the Lord. So as a result of that, the Lord sent a plague. See, let me just say this again. God doesn't do things just out of just because he wants to be a bad guy. His judgment does come, though, after he's been long-suffering, long-suffering, long-suffering. But then when it does come, he may come with a vengeance. So, so here, listen to this. He, the plague came in Israel. 70,000 people died as a result, and God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. So, but, but as the angel was preparing to destroy it, the Lord relented and said to the deaf angel to stop. Now, this is right before he was about to hit it. See, remember, Israel was the whole, whole country. But now he's hitting toward Jerusalem. So he said, stop. He said, that is enough. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord that was standing at the threshing floor of Arna, the, the Jebusite. Now, Arona, the, the Jebusite, was there. Now, he owned a, a threshing floor. So if you jump down to verse 22, and I, I think I have time to go through this. So, so David said to Arona, he said, listen, let me buy this threshing floor from you for the full price. For the full price. And so <laughs> Arona said, listen, man, you can have it all. That's what he told him. He said, I, I, take it, my Lord. Take the oxen. Take the, I'll give for the birth, the birth offerings, the threshing for, for, for wood to build, the fire, the altar, the wheat, and the grain. Of, I'll give it all to you. But he told him, I need this to stop the plague. So which what he told him. King said to him, said, no, I insist on buying it for the full price. I won't take what's yours and give it to the Lord. I'm not going to present burnt offerings that cost me nothing. For the plague to stop. David had to build an altar of sacrifice. David knew that he had to make it up, but he could not allow someone to give it to him free. You know how Christians want stuff free? Man, some of y'all have businesses. You don't even want to go to Christians. Why? Because nobody wants to pay. They want to get it free. What I'm saying to you, somebody's got to pay. The only way for God to see that we are serious with him is going to take great sacrifice. Well, what sacrifice? Getting up early. What sacrifice? Going to church. What sacrifice? Surrendering your talents and your skills unto the Lord so that you recognize that these skills that I have are not just to be paid, but these skills that I have are unto God. I want to do everything I can to serve the Lord with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. You know my time's almost gone. If it doesn't cost you, it's not going to break the plague. I'm telling you right now, the church... In the breaking of this plague, God's got to break us another level. He's got to break us another level. It's not, I know things seem like they're turning, but Lord, I th have things turned inside of us. Father, I just pray right now, as we look at these scriptures, Lord, we know that you are getting our attention. And Lord, we don't want to be at a place where you come in and you have to braid a cord and come in and whip it and slashing and turning over tables. But inside, I feel like that's what you've done. You want us to see, Lord, that we aren't building a big temple. We were, we're building a house of prayer. So, Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that you will move among us, Lord, and also that, Father, for our own personal relationship with you, Lord, we do whatever it costs. Lord, we don't, we don't want to take anything from anybody Lord, we want to pay the full price that you will move on our behalf. So, Lord, I just thank you right now, Father, for all that we're doing. This is a great time. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just want to encourage you that now's the time. Just surrender your heart. Most of this message actually was directed to Christians that should know better. But if you or a woman or a man, if you've not committed your life to Jesus, please ask the Lord to say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I repent of my sins. I confess I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. 
and I ask you to be Lord and Savior over my life. See, if you do this, the Lord promises us that if you call on him, he'll hear, he'll hear your prayer. So if you declare him as Lord and Savior, Lord, I want to declare you as Lord and Savior of my life. And Lord, you're number one. I refuse to serve sin. I repent, meaning I turn toward you, and I dedicate my heart to you. I dedicate my heart, and I declare you as number one in my life. If you listen to me, you can pray this prayer. And I'll just pray this. Lord, I pray for every person here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Just, just say this prayer. Lord, I'm sorry for all sins I've committed. Forgive me. I repent. And I turn toward you. I call you now my Lord and my Savior. I dedicate my heart to you as I declare you as my king. I surrender my life to you and from this moment forward I will live for you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Believers also use this time to get in here like never before. Now I want to just ask you that in this time also you got to take up an offering. Well, I'm not physically here to take up the offering. Can I? I can't do it physically. But I just want you to know that it's important for you to be able to give right now. So you can text. We have an even simple. Some people are on, on push pay. You can do it. But after that, you can text 7797. 7797. It'll bring you to an app. In some cases, you can download it. You don't even have to do that. You can put your information in it. It's very, it's very confidential. And then you text the TFHATL. TFHATL. And that's what brings you to the app, I should say. And then you can give that way. That's the easiest way. Most people give that way. Or you can also mail your gift to 6060 Spalding Drive. They're, they're in Peachtree Corners or Norcross, either one. And you can send it to us. So everyone, the church should not suffer because the church has left the building. That the church shall be increased. We're, we're a storehouse. So all those that are tithing, you tithe. All those that are giving, you give. And, that, and I also look forward to seeing you here on Zoom. If you'd like to join us, come to our website. By the way, we have a new website. So it's the Father's House ATL. The Father's House ATL.org. The Father's House ATL.org. Come to see our new website too. We're, we're excited about what God is doing. Amen. So now let me just pray and close. It, it, this has been exciting. Oh my God, it's been so exciting. Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done. We recognize, Father, that you are bringing us to a new place. Lord, help us in this time of isolation, in this time of lockdown, all these things, Lord, as we're beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we see the hope in you more than the hope of our old normal becoming our new normal. Lord, I pray, Father, that we're pursuing you with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you. Appreciate you joining in with us. Listen, share, make comments, tell people they need to see it. And tell, put on your on your Facebook site. Let other people know what Bishop Hunt preached today. Everyone needs to hear it. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you next week.